we are still on the subject of transmission. <clears throat> now, as a subset of transmission, we have been looking now from week five all the way up until this week, we've been looking at the subject of Bible manuscripts. And last week, week number nine, we began looking at the major witnesses of the New Testament text. Tonight, we're gonna finish up looking at major witnesses of the New Testament text. Last week, we looked at the primary witnesses of the New Testament Greek manuscripts. <clears throat> we looked at Codex Vaticanus, also known as B. <laughs> they assign these letters or some sort of designation for these manuscripts. Codex Sinaiticus, a.k.a. Aleph. Codex Alexandrinus, also known as Manuscript A. Codex Washingtonius, which is actually two manuscripts uh, designated by the letters W and I. And lastly, we looked at Codex Beza, a.k.a. D. This isn't all of them. There are more than these. But we have covered the main ones. Now, there's one more category of manuscripts that we're going to be looking at tonight. Not so much because of the impact that these manuscripts have on Bible translations. These manuscripts have not been used to create Bible translations, but they have been used to compare with other manuscripts that we have. The last group that we are going to cover tonight are the papyri manuscripts. Now, the papyri manuscripts have quite a story behind them, and so let's get ready to do a little bit of reading, okay? Let's check this out. The first important discovery of Greek papyri made in modern times was among the ruins of Herculaneum near Naples, where in 1752, in the ruins of the house of a philosopher, which had been destroyed and buried by volcanic ashes from Vesuvius, 79 AD, ever heard about that <clears throat> volcano that erupted? A whole library of papyrus rolls was found quite charred by the heat. With the utmost pains, many of these have been unrolled and deciphered, and the first part of them was published in 1793, many years after they were discovered. They consist almost wholly of works of Epicurean philosophy, Greek, Greekish philosophy. These marvelous finds raise the possibility that other papyri might be recovered in the future. Then, we jump ahead a long time, <clears throat> then in the first part of the 19th century, these texts begin to trickle in. And by the end of the century, massive numbers of papyri had appeared. The source of these documents <clears throat> was hot, dry Egypt, whose silting sands through the centuries had become their silent storehouse. One area in Egypt which has proved fruitful in exploration is the Fayum, or Fayum, located about 70 miles southwest, southwest excuse me, of Cairo, it was very fertile in ancient times due to the overflow of the Nile through its canals. Following Alexander's conquests, Greek cities were built there and remained there for several hundred years. Subsequently, the canals fell into disrepair, the towns were abandoned, and the desert took over. In 1889-90, Flinders or Flinders, it's probably Flinders, I don't know, one or the other. Flinders Petri discovered in the Fayum a large number of inscribed papyri, which had served as wrappings for some 30 mummies. In 1891, Frederick G. Kenyon, very well-known <coughs> uh, archaeologist, a young assistant in the British Museum, 
published a recently acquired papyrus of Aristotle's Athenian Constitution. In Oxford, another young scholar, B.P. Grenfell, read Canyon's publication, which turned his interest to the study of Greek papyri. In 1895, the Egypt Exploration Fund sent D.G. Hogarth and Grenfell to the Fayum for trial ex excavations in the search of papyri. So successful were their efforts that Grenfell telegraphed A.S. Hunt, whoever that is, his close friend in Oxford, and asked him to join their work. And we're just going through this to get the background of this discovery. Grenfell was 26 years old, Hunt was 24, and thus began a partnership of excavation study and publication that was to extend for a lifetime. Well, this led to something. Let's talk about the Oxyrhynchus papyri. The following winter of 1896 through 97 found Grenfell and Hunt again in Egypt at an ancient site called Oxyrhynchus, which had been a Greek town. The, Greek, the Greeks named it Oxyrhynchus after a fish by that name, which the local people considered sacred. The site was chosen by Grenfell because it was known to be a leading Christian town in the third and fourth centuries. As they began to excavate, they found papyri fragments, not in ancient cemeteries, churches, or monasteries. Rather, they found them in ancient rubbish heaps. Here we go again, just like Codex Sinaiticus. Manuscripts found in rubbish heaps are not rubbish per se or defective copies. When a manuscript became old and worn, it was customary to replace it with a fresh copy and then discard the old one. The Egyptians were known to have disposed of such copies not by burning them, but by putting them into rubbish heaps. So there you go. Grenfell and Hunt's choice for the ancient rubbish heap at Oxyrhynchus was fortuitous, for it yielded the largest cache of papyri ever discovered. From the time they began digging in 1897, they made new finds of papyrus fragments almost continually, day after day, week after week, until they ceased operations in 1906. The site yielded volumes of papyrus fragments containing all sorts of written material. They found literature, business, legal contracts, letters, <clears throat> all kinds of stuff. But also, no less than 27 manuscripts of portions of the New Testament. 20 of these date to the second, third, or early fourth centuries. All of these, though fragmentary, are earlier than the Vatican or Sinaitic manuscripts, and some predate them by 150 years. Actually, more than that, as we'll see in just a moment. So, here we have these Oxyrhynchus papyrus manuscripts. Amazing. Let's talk about some of the significant Oxyrhynchus papyrus manuscripts. First of all, there's P1. P1 was discovered on the second day of the dig. Now, papyri are denoted with the symbol P and are numbered according to the order in which they are found. Hence, P1, 2, 3, 4, and on and on it goes. I think they're over the hundreds by now. At the time of this recovery, this was the earliest extant or original copy of any New Testament portion at least 100 years earlier than Codex Vaticanus, which was approximately 325 to 375, they guess. The copyist of P P1 seems to have faithfully followed a very reliable exemplar or model or copy. 
This third century manuscript contains, well, there it is, Matthew 1 and 12 and 14 through 20. So it's a fragment. Now, I actually obtained, in fact, just last week, uh, I obtained a, a module from one of my Bible programs, a Bible program that I am very fond of, Bible Works. And I obtained, uh, basically, all of the uh, papyri manuscripts that have been found. And uh, it's included in the Bible software package that I have now. It, it sort of works very well. But what I'm able to do is I'm able to uh, start up this particular module, and there before my eyes is P1 through whatever it is. And you can click on it, and it brings up all the information about that particular manuscript, where it was found, approximate date of the manuscript, uh, maybe some features about the manuscript, um, a few photographs of the, the, the fragments of the manuscript. Many of these manuscripts, I mean, they're all just fragments. Some of them are, are just, there's just a few fragments. I'll, I'll show you a couple tonight. But anyway, but it's very cool. So you can read all the information about these manuscripts. And so, yes, they're very fragmentary. P1 was fragmentary. The next one there, P23. P23 contains James uh, 1, <clears throat> 10 through 12, 15 through 18. This fragment dated 200, 200 AD. This fragment is the earliest extant manuscript of James 1. In general, P23 agrees with codices Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, and this long name here, Ephraimi uh, Rescriptus, which represents the best texts of the general epistles. So here we have a, a manuscript, P23, that matches or agrees with these other codices that were written much later. And then the last one we're going to look at from, from the Oxyrhynchus Papyrus group is P39. Now, this manuscript showing John 8, 14 through 22 was produced in the third century. The large letters and beautiful calligraphy shows that this manuscript was probably produced by a professional scribe for church use. Codex Vaticanus agrees with P39 verbatim. So this is interesting. Here you have another manuscript. You're, look, you're looking through all these manuscripts found in the same area. And you can tell one manuscript was, was written before or after another one. <clears throat> and you can tell that they were written by different people just by virtue of the type of font that you find. Very interesting. Now, so that's the Oxyrhynchus papyrus. Let's take a look at another group of papyri. The next one, the Chester Beatty papyri. Yes, that's right, named after Chester Beatty. <laughs> Go figure. In 1931, it was announced that 12 manuscripts were found in a Coptic graveyard in Egypt, stowed away in jars eight books of the Old Testament and three of the New Testament. Well, we're missing one there. Yeah, it's because it wasn't a biblical manuscript. It was a manuscript of something else, okay? It is generally believed that the manuscripts came from the ruins of an ancient church or monastery. These manuscripts were likely hidden during the Diocletian persecution. These manuscripts were purchased from a dealer in Egypt during the 1930s by Chester Beatty and by the University of Michigan. The three New Testament manuscripts in this collection were the earliest manuscripts to contain large portions of the New Testament text. Now, picture, if you will, you're, you're an archaeologist and you dig, this, you dig this up. First of all, all, all archaeological diggings are funded by someone, funded by a university, funded by somebody who has a lot of money. And so somebody digs this up. He doesn't have the rights to the th those things. It's whoever is paying him to dig those up, unless he's, unless he's, he's uh, supporting himself, of course. 
And so somebody has rights to those manuscripts. So somebody comes along, maybe you're Chester Beatty, and you're saying, I'll give you $5 million for those manuscripts or what have you. And they're going to stick them in a museum somewhere. Somebody's going to probably inspect them, research them, and then they're going to stick them in a museum somewhere. Thank God for that. Because we, just, we have all this, this evidence just laying around of the reliability of the New Testament. So, so now we have the Chester Beatty ones. Let's take a look here at the significant Chester Beatty papyrus manuscripts. There's some, some interesting ones here. First of all, there's P45. This codex has the four Gospels and Acts. According to Frederick Canyon, the order of the books in the original intact manuscript was probably as follows. Matthew, John, Luke, Mark, Acts. This manuscript was dated by Canyon to the early 3rd century, a date which was confirmed by other papyrologists. In Mark, P45 shows a strong affinity with those manuscripts called Caesarean. In Matthew, Luke, and John, P45 stands midway between the Alexandrian manuscripts and Western manuscripts. In Acts, P45 shows the greatest affinity with the Alexandrian uncials as over against the manuscripts with a Western text. This is very interesting. So we have these different variants even within this collection of manuscripts or this one particular manuscript, P45. So that's just some interesting features about P45. How about the other one, P46? This codex has most of Paul's epistles, excluding the pastoral epistles, in this order. And then there's this order. Scholarly consensus puts its date at around 200 AD. <clears throat> P46 is considered to be a proto-Alexandrian text type. An Alexandrian text type <clears throat> before the Alexandrian <clears throat> manuscript, the one that we talked about, a few weeks ago was even found. This is an image of P46. We've looked at this image before. Very, very interesting. Notice, you guys remember our discussion from a few weeks ago? You'll notice this is the manuscript that we use that has what? Remember those things right there? The nomina sacra, remember that? The sacred names that are underlined. <clears throat> we have uh, theos, God, abbreviated underneath this line which shows the sacred names, Christ, right? Very, very interesting. So, and you find that throughout the papyri fragments. In fact, now that I have copies of these on my, on my laptop, <clears throat> on, my, on my computer, I can see, I can just scroll through them and see all the, the nomina sacra there. I don't know how much, I, I may share a little bit more, I'm, I'm learning a little bit more about the nomina sacra and uh, I, may, I may share that at some point, I'm not sure. I think we probably covered that well enough. But anyway, <clears throat> there you have it in that particular, uh, that particular manuscript. Another one from this collection is P47. This third century codex retain, contains Revelation 9, 10 through 17, 2, interestingly. It is the earliest manuscript preserving this portion of Revelation. Codex Sinaiticus agrees with P47. So again, these are fragmentary. In fact, if you were to look at this program that I just got that shows you the papyri, it'll show a, a sheet, and then it'll show part of the sheet grayed out. That means that's part of the fragment, that's part of the, uh, of the codex that's missing. Now, we can tell what's there by the rest of it. You see, we have so many Greek manuscripts that we can figure out what kind of text or what part of the Bible is on a manuscript, even if it's only a fragment, because we have so many other manuscripts to compare it with. So it's very, very cool. So <clears throat> let's talk about another grouping of papyri. Let's talk about the Bodmer papyri. Yes, named after M. Martin Bodmer. <laughs> Although not nearly as well known, another amazing discovery of papyri took place in 1952, the Bodmer papyri. 
These papyri were found north of the ancient city of Thebes in Upper Egypt. Mr. Martin Bodmer of Geneva, Switzerland purchased the main body of the papyri, but other items went to Sir Chester Beatty and to other libraries. The Bodmer collection is made up of a large number of papyri written in Greek and in Coptic Egyptian. Of these, the most important are the Greek manuscripts, which encompasses texts of the Old and New Testament and other related works. The Bodmer papyri are of great value. The Coptic materials are very meaningful, but much more important are the three manuscripts of the New Testament. They include an early text of most of the Gospel of John, of an early copy of 1st and 2nd Peter complete, and large portions of Luke and John from an early codex. Now, let's talk about some of the significant ones. P66. <clears throat> this manuscript contains most of John's Gospel. The manuscript is usually dated 200 AD, but the renowned paleographer Herbert Hunger has argued that P66 should be dated to the first half, if not the first quarter of the second century. And of course, that would be amazing, because that would put it about 60 some, 50, well, no, that would put it about 35 to 60 years after the Gospel of John was written, or excuse me, the book of Revelation was written. That would be amazing, okay? With a practiced, and I wanted to read this, I wanted to, you to see this just because I, I just think it's so interesting. With a practiced calli calligraphic hand, the scribe of P66 wrote in larger print as he went along in order to fill out the codex. The large print throughout indicates that it was written to be read aloud. The scribe of P66 was very likely a Christian. The text exhibits his knowledge of other portions of scripture. He harm, then in parentheses it gives some examples. His use of standard nomina sacra, okay, so he used nomina sacra and his special use of nomina sacra for the words cross and crucify. So he actually extended the use of nomina sacra to include some other things that I guess that he considered sacred, right? The cross and the word crucified. So P66, a very interesting, written so that it could be read aloud. Check this next one out. P75. Now this one's pretty cool. This codex contains most of Luke and John. P75 can be dated to the late second century. The copyist of P75 was a literate scribe, trained in making books. See, they know this, they can tell by just looking at it. His craftsmanship shows through in his tight calligraphy and controlled copying. The scribe's Christianity shows in his abbreviation of the Nomina Sacra, spelled wrong there, sorry about that, as well as in, in his abbreviation of the word cross. These are telltale tell tell signs of a scribe who belonged to the Christian community. Furthermore, the large typeface indicates that the manuscript was composed to be read aloud. Again, the scribe even added a system of sectional divisions to aid any would-be lector. Thus, we have a manuscript written by a Christian for other Christians. Now, I find that to be fascinating. So here he makes it easier for whoever's going to be picking up this manuscript to read to make sure it's easier to read to a public audience, to an audience. There are several indications of the scribe's Alexandrian orientation. First and foremost is his scriptural acumen. Let me explain that. 
He is the best of all the early Christian scribes, at least the best that we've seen. And his manuscript is an extremely accurate copy. P75 is the result of a single force, namely the disciplined scribe who writes with the intention of being careful and accurate. There's no evidence of revision of his work by anyone else, or in fact of any real revision or check. The control had been drilled into the scribe before he started writing. One scholar established the fact that P75 displays the kind of text that was used in making Codex Vaticanus. This scribe Porter was his name, demonstrated 87% agreement between P75 and Vaticanus. In general, textual scholars have a, very, have a high regard for the textual fidelity of P75. So what you have here, obviously, is a manuscript that people are looking at and they recognize, wow, this individual was really a very schooled man. Very, very articulate the way it was written, easy to read, perhaps the punctu there was good punctuation. Don't you appreciate it when you pick up someone's handwritten note or you get a letter and you can read it easily? <clears throat> I remember I used to receive letters from my dad. My, my, my mom used to comment on how sloppy my dad's handwriting was. I remember I would get letters from him as a kid <clears throat> and I could barely read them. <laughs> my mom could read them, but I couldn't read them very well. Now, of course, whenever I got a letter from my grandmother, I could read it perfectly. Her handwriting was very good. So you, you can appreciate the value in receiving a letter from someone who has handwriting that's legible. Or what about if somebody hands you a note that you're supposed to read out loud? Don't you appreciate it when maybe the sentences are double-spaced between them? Good punctuation. And by the way, it's good to use punctuation when you read out loud. There's a reason a comma is there or a colon, or a semicolon is there. Or, when there's a period. You know, a period means what? Stop, right? It's a stop. It's the end of a sentence. Pause for a second, right? So it's nice when you pick up something and you can tell it was, it was well written. So here, P75 obviously was well written. Let's take a look at just two more, very quickly. Other important papyrus manuscripts, not part of the other collection. P32, and I have a reason for wanting to cover these two. P32, this manuscript, Preserving Titus, is dated about 150 to 175. How about that? So this could have been directly copied from original, maybe, making it the earliest extant copy of any of the pastoral epistles. Codex Sinaiticus agrees, largely agrees with P32. One of my personal favorites, P52. This fragment containing just John 18, 31 through 34 and 37 through 38, that's it. That's all it contains. Is noteworthy because of its early date, 110 to 125. That's amazing. Now you're probably talking directly transcribed from the Gospel of John, the autograph itself. Many scholars have confirmed this dating. P52 came from Phium or from Oxyrhynchus. So it was <clears throat> one of those that was attained from Oxyrhynchus. It was acquired in 1920 by Grenfell, but it, rem un it remained unnoticed among hundreds of papyri until 1934 when G.H. Roberts recognized that this scrap preserves a few verses from John's gospel. So imagine that. They're sifting through all of these manuscripts, right? And they're, oh, look, here's a big one. Here's a big one. Here's a big one. Here's a, eh, scrap. Here's a big one. Here's a, I mean, wouldn't you be going for the, the ones that just were larger, maybe? Eh, a little scrap there. <clears throat> Suddenly, years later, somebody picks up that scrap and realizes, wait a minute. This is from the Gospel of John. And this has an older dating than the other ones. Now, we've shown this one before, but there it is. That's it. From the Gospel of John, chapter 18. By the way, I think it's the encounter between Jesus and Pilate. 
So there we have the oldest fragment that we know of right now from the Gospel of John. So, there you have the papyrus manuscripts. Now, let me just say this. While we're on the subject of manuscripts, I want to make you all aware of a very valuable resource for anyone who wants to pursue the subject of textual criticism or if you even, even if you want to study uh, New Testament Greek for your own personal study, which, by the way, I think is a great endeavor for anyone to engage themselves in. But one of the great blessings that we have because of the technological advances today is the accessibility of resources that would otherwise be beyond our reach. Today we have available to us very unique, what they call critical editions of the Greek New Testament. Now critical editions of the Greek New Testament have been around for years. But as new material has become available, critical editions of the Greek New Testament have become a treasure drove of information of, about the original text. Now, right here is, an, is, is a uh, scan from a page of one of your typical uh, critical editions of the Greek New Testament. It looks, it looks very busy, I realize that. You would, you would indeed have to be able to read Greek to make much sense of it. But one of the things I want to point out is if you do learn to read Greek and you are able to uh, at least recognize Greek letters and words, one of the values of something like this is what they do in these critical editions is they have a, well, let's go back and let's look at an explanation of this. Most scholars and translators today use one of two modern critical editions of the Greek New Testament. There's the Nestle Allen Greek New Testament and or the United Bible Society's Greek New Testament. These editions are described as critical editions because the text that they contained is not a copy of any one manuscript. <laughs> Instead, the text is a result of modern textual scholarship. So actually what it is, it's what we call an eclectic text. It's a combination of a number of texts, of a number of manuscripts, and they, they compile a Greek New Testament. There's the actual New Testament right there. And then what you have is a whole series of little symbols and footnotes that point you down here to this bottom area, which is called a textual apparatus. It's a big, <laughs> long name, but what it simply means is it's showing you if there's a footnote next to a word, and there's a, that's telling you that there could be a variant reading. In other words, this is a reading that maybe the Greek scholars agreed on, but they're showing you that other manuscripts had a different reading. And what they're doing is they're giving you a symbol to show you down here what other manuscripts had that reading. And what this does is it basically puts the manuscripts that we have in the palm of your hand or on your lap, if you happen to have the book form. You can get this, by the way, in software too. And what it does is it puts those manuscripts right at your disposal. So you can see yourself where a variant reading was. And I just think that's fascinating. It's fantastic for us. And it allows us to do some, some very uh, serious study of the Greek New Testament. Now, one last comment about manuscripts. Sometimes when we compare different versions of the English Bible, we see differences, don't we? Some of this is based on the New Testament manuscripts behind a particular translation, English translation. <clears throat> there are sometimes some very heated debates about which translations are good, English translations I'm talking about, which translations are good and which translations are bad. The debate centers on two theories about which Greek manuscripts are the best. One theory, known as the critical text view, one theory is that the oldest manuscripts are the most accurate, Codex Vaticanus, Vaticanus Codex Sinaiticus, 
The theory there is that the oldest manuscripts are most significant even though they are fewer in number, but they're older. The other theory, the majority text theory, or the Byzant, those that favor the Byzantine theory, <clears throat> the other theory is that the type of manuscripts that survived in the greatest numbers, and there are more of those, the manuscripts that survived in greatest numbers are the most accurate even though they are less ancient. Most modern translations are based on the critical textual theory that the Alexandrian text types are the most accurate because they're the oldest. You have the NIV, the NASB, the RSV, a whole bunch of translations have come from that text textual family. Remember that? We talked about the families of manuscripts. The King James and the New King James versions are based on the majority textual theory. This explains why occasionally a significant disagreement is found in the New Testament between the King James Version and the modern translations. But regardless of the discrepancies, the discrepancies are not major. Scholars and interpreters are going to continue to, be, to debate the theories, but no major doctrines or principles are affected by the discrepancies between the Greek text and the resultant English versions of the Bible. We just have too much of the text available to us for, to us, for us to be confused about it. Uh, honestly, and I, and I mean that. I know there's some very, I used to be a very strong King James only advocate. So I, I understand the passion of being behind that particular, of adapting that particular view. But when you're actually looking at the Greek and you have all this evidence before you, it's not hard to come to your own conclusion because we have it all. <clears throat> and so I don't, I, don't, I don't buy this idea that there's some conspiracy to try to cover up the majority text, the Byzantine text by the Alexandrian group. And all. I, don't, I don't buy that because it's just all there for us to see and to look at and to behold. The evidence isn't hidden. And there are so many different copies of the Greek New Testament, even though there's only two main critical texts that we look at. There's so many other manuscript, there's so much manuscript evidence that we can look at and come to a proper conclusion. And that's a good thing. So, that's it. We're done with transmission. We're done talking about manuscripts. Lord willing, next week, we're going to delve into the subject of the canon. The canon. The books of the Bible. We have 66 books in our Bible. How come the Apocrypha wasn't included in our Old Testament? And how come we don't have some of those other Gospels? I mean, I learned from that movie, The Da Vinci Code, that there was a big cover-up to hide the reality that there are other Gospels that that Roman Catholic Church didn't want you to know about, or Protestants didn't want you to know about. So we're going to talk about the conspiracy of the Da Vinci Code and put that to rest and talk about the canon, why it is we have the books that we have. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Thank God for his word. Thank God that he has not left us defenseless. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. You guys know that, right? The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. The Word that God has given us from Genesis to Revelation is the Word of God. All Scripture, Paul told Timothy, is God breathed. That all Scripture that Paul is talking about is Genesis to Revelation. It's all given to us, God's gift to us, so that we may know the will of the Lord. Amen?